You're now listening to the sound of sanity, Dalton. The sound will continue until the uh, whatever. All right, I'd like to begin my four-part apology for that opening <laughs> with an explanation. So, number one, I promised our friend Dalton months ago that I would shout him out at the beginning of an episode because he gave me some salsa. So, <laughs> thanks for the salsa, Dalton. There's your shout out, shout out. And I didn't just do it in like this part. I did it in the music part. Now, number two, as I did that, I forgot what our actual spiel is, and I still don't know <laughs> that I could... You're now Pull listening it. to The Sound of Sanity. The sound will continue for the duration of the program. Have you ever done the thing where it's like you use your pin number all the time? You use it without, like, without thinking you can do it, but if you try and think of it, you lose it. And I've actually lost a pin number forever because I, I tried to, like, I, my fingers would just do it. And then one day I was like, what's my pin number? And I messed it up. I crossed the wires in my brain. and It disappeared. And it disappeared. It deleted. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that. The four numbers is just like what order they went into. And uh, my card was locked out and it was very sad. So anyway, Dalton, thank you for the salt salsa. It was delicious. And there's your shout out. I hope you're listening. If you're not, then the salsa was gross. No, just kidding. It was good. I am Nathan. Speaking of gross, I'm the opposite of gross. Unless you count awesomeness in the quantity of a gross of awesomeness. Isn't gross a number? Term. Yeah, it is. That's yeah, so true. I could be a gross of awesome. Yeah, you can. And speaking of gross of awesome, Ben thinks it's awesome to be gross. <laughs> He's always smearing boogers on other people's foreheads. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other part of my apology. Uh, Very little sleep last night. I got two babies and one of them decided to wake up at six. And the other one decided to wake up, you know, every three hours to get fed so that she would live. So... Between that and stuff, just wasn't a much sleep. So anyway, Ben likes to uh, do whatever I just accused him of, and he's a disgusting man. His name is Ben Silzer. He's a preacher. He's a teacher of righteousness. How are we doing, old Ben? Good, Nathan. He said a booger on your forehead. <laughs> yeah. How did that get there, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> More where that came oh, from. Oh, no, he struck again. <laughs> Hey, why don't you introduce a man who's never had a... Dang it. <laughs> Got a program that one did not repeat. None of the other ones repeat. I don't think this one repeats. Yep, that one just ends. All right. But the one that I always do. Anyway, Ben, a man yeah. who's, I, I dare say, never had a booger on his forehead. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> why don't you introduce him? All right. It's Jake Mensel, the pastor who's a master of sanity. I've never had a booger on my forehead. Yep, you, it's it's, good. you've got a beautiful boogerless forehead right now. <laughs> Thanks. And most of the time. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen a booger on Jake's forehead. Have you? No, no. If it was there, it was very small and hard to see, maybe covered by hair or something. <laughs> oh, maybe. Man. Guys, it's November in the church, as, <laughs> as this channel is called on our Discord, which you can get to through patreon.com forward slash uh, sound of sanity, which by the way, leave us a nice review. While I'm saying businessy things, we could use some nice reviews. Leave one on Apple or whatever oh, you use to listen. Or else I'll be there. Watch your back. Yeah. Watch your forehead. Or else the booger <laughs> phantom is coming. For the you booger folks. man, as we call him. The booger man, yeah. Yes. <laughs> there is a booger man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a oh, new title for Ben. I'm I'm glad. Poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah. I just I, I kept Trying to pull poltergeist, poltergeist in our stagecoach episode, and I couldn't pull it. For what? For what purpose? Door scenes. It's got some great door scenes. Some of the best. We were talking about door scenes. I think the best door scene of Steven Spielberg's career is obviously the little boy in Close Encounters. Close Encounters, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the orange light that's coming great. through the window is really great. All right, folks, that's neither here nor there. If you want to hear that conversation, you can go to Sanity at the Movies and listen to our stagecoach episode, a very fun episode about Western movies and the movie stagecoach. But today we are talking about. The church, the state of the church in, did we ever introduce Bo Booger Forehead, Jake? Yeah, we did. We did. We are talking about the state of the church, and we are talking about it vis-a-vis -vis articles and things that our lovely fans on Discord have provided for us. This is another one of our fan-generated episodes. So here's the thing. The first thing that was dropped in there, 
by our good friend and fan, Jake. <laughs> Jake Menzel. <laughs> Apple News article on a hundred million campaign aims to fix Jesus brand. Finally, Jesus. hundred million dollar campaign. Yes, I'm go. sorry. hundred, did I say hundred dollar campaign? You said hundred million. Uh, you just said hundred million campaign. Yeah, a hundred and mil, uh, million, a hundred and million campaign aims to fix Jesus brand. I think I've seen some of these, like Facebook has given me some of these ads, like. I mean, they were on during like the postseason and baseball type type thing, and yeah. It's like, do you like rebels? Do you like activists? Do you like like Jesus was one progressive stuff? Yeah, Jesus was one. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. It's dumb. That kind of branding goes all the way back to the '60s when there was all that Jesus was a flower child <laughs> kind of stuff, which is an entire terrible musical called Godspell. Well, and also Jesus Christ Superstar, another terrible musical. Oh. It was written to sort of cash in on the Jesus as uh, proto hippie thing. I've just became become a little less happy because I clicked on their their website, the mm-hmm. website for this marketing campaign. He gets us fans. They offer all kinds of he gets us gear. You can get a t shirt, a hat, a sticker, a water bottle. And do you guys know how much these things cost? T shirt, suggested price. Welcome a stranger. Hat, suggested price. Forgive someone. Sticker, suggested price. Pay someone a compliment. Water bottle, suggested price. Serve the poor. Whoa, hot take. Ben's against forgiveness and <laughs> serving, serving the poor. The poor. <laughs> I've been found out, boys. <laughs> Time to scram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad. This website makes me... Really Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that. This is really, that's really icky. All right. They had that, that ads like during the playoffs. They even had like on the green screen, like you can see... While somebody's batting, just like he mm. gets us and yeah. stuff like that. Man, adults are lame. Adults are so lame. What a lame campaign. I mean, it's <laughs> stupid and sinful and there's lots wrong with it. But guess what? It is to be cool. To be cool is to be authentic. Authenticity is all that teenagers hunger for. It's all they want. It's all that young people are interested in. You cannot fake it. And when you can create a fatuous, fake, stupid ad campaign to say, Jesus was authentic, man. Just like they don't fall for it. Nobody's falling for this. Nobody thinks this is cool. I don't, I, you know, you're not going to find a young person who's like, whoa, Jesus was an activist. Is, is, people aren't that dumb. Maybe they are that dumb, and I just don't want to believe that they're that dumb. But I think most people aren't that dumb. I don't think anybody's going to be helped or this is going to be the first step towards anyone coming to a mm-hmm. better understanding of Jesus or any kind of understanding. I just think most people are going to reject this out of hand for the phony nonsense that it is maybe that's too optimistic of me mm-hmm. but i don't know that is why you fail you're a loser loser 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 all right guys <laughs> next article uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's Mr. McCracken. What's coming out? What's next? Is it McCracken? Yeah. Don't throw past. Stop throwing pastors under the bus, Nathan. I'm sorry, Ben. I didn't mean to throw pastors under the bus. How am I throwing pastors under the bus? This is by Brett McCracken, our old buddy. Well, if you say that pastors are doing something or they're not doing something and they should or they shouldn't be, then you're throwing pastors under the bus on social media, don't you know? Don't throw them under the bus. Get on the bus with them. Help them to swerve to avoid don't, the potholes. Don't throw Twitter critics of pastors under the bus, Brett McCracken. Get on the bus with them and help them to do a better job of criticizing pastors. How about that? How do you like that? <laughs> a little reframe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Brett McCracken's whole thing over the last couple of years as he's been promoting his book, The Wisdom Pyramid, I believe it's called. Yes. There, look, I just threw in a, a promotion for it is like we need to get off the internet and internet culture is dumb and social media is destroying us which i don't suppose i really disagree with any of that there there are certainly lots of backstreet back backstreet boys lots of uh backseat driver layman types who like to criticize their betters on twitter it certainly happens i was going after a friend of mine just i think this morning he was like true or false uh, voting Democrat should be a cause of immediate church discipline. It's like, okay, well, you got that from some faux pseudo poser pastor on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And the answer to that is, in fact, no. What if they? What if they became a Christian? On, let's just just 
what if somebody became a Christian on Monday and voted on Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Does this create the scenario? Are you going to discipline that person because they voted for some Democrats? Well, Jake, what if they became a Christian and fornicated on Tuesday? Well, I, I think that there's just a lot of things that you have to do with baby Christians to help them understand themselves and the world and their sin. And there's just no blanket statements. Yeah, work. the people who get popular on Twitter tend to be, what would the word be? Unnuanced. They're just like, this is the way it is, which makes people feel really flattered. Validated. Validated. Because they're like, yeah, that is the way it is. I don't like the Democratic Party either. This guy dislikes it even more than me. Cool. This validates me and I feel good. Right. I mean, it's, it's the same. I wish my pastor was as hardcore as this person speaking into the void who, I don't know the first thing about this person, but I guarantee you, you know, he's not the kind of person that actually, well, I don't guarantee guarantee you, but how many people have we known in these types of scenarios? It's like, man, you would not trust this person to love or shepherd or care for somebody in real life. Uh, they're not even, you're worried about their family. You're worried about their wife and kids. Mm -hmm. They don't have any business speaking, right? you know, shouting into the void. As if there's some kind of leader. Well, oftentimes it just feels like they have no faith for indwelling sin. They just, they just want to pretend like it's, it's, it's like the new legalism. They just want to pretend like all sin has been banished with Christ. Right. And, and so obviously a Christian wouldn't vote Democrat. Right. Obviously they should be banished from the church if they do. Yeah. Duh. Duh. Well, that, if that's a pastor saying that, one thing that you know is that he's not, he doesn't have people come into faith in his church. Yeah, he's never right. ha actually had to walk or never been willing to actually walk through with so someone who's just realizing, hey, I just came to faith. I guess that might have some ramifications for my political thinking, too. And yet I am immature in this because I just woke up. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so it's fine. So I guess we well, what they end up doing is they encourage, and even if they're better than the principles they shout on social media, their followers aren't. They take those lines and they take and turn and use them to judge their faithful pastor in their churches. It's mm -hmm. just like, guys, come on. They are the modern day Pharisees who tie yokes around people's necks that they could never bear or carry themselves. Right. Yep. So I don't know if that leaves us siding with McCracken on this, but I mean, I guess I didn't read the article. So. I, I, I did, I think, or at least I skimmed it and Eh. I suppose we side with McCracken. I don't trust McCracken. I think he's, I think he's catching a wave and sitting on top of the world. I, I mean, I think he's sensing the w way the wind's blowing and just being the same kind of people pleaser that he's always been. He's like a lot of people are tired of social media. A lot of people are annoyed by social media. A lot of Christians are doing no screen November or or whatever. It's not really a very provocative or challenging position to take that there's a lot of hyperbole and crap on social media. So uh, I, I trust us to say it because we say a lot of other things. And so within the context of you knowing us, you know that that's one of many lines that we draw. But when McCracken says it, it's like, that's been his only thing for the last two years and I think that's just him finding another popular scapegoat and beating up on it. Maybe that's uncharitable. I don't know. But next. Oh, negative. Well, oh, no, actually, next is something I did not listen to, so I don't know what to say. But it's a Alistair Begg podcast, What Happened to Expository Preaching. Mm -hmm. Truth for Life. Yeah, apparently he talked about some of the substitutes that pastors typically fall into. The cheerleader, the conjurer, the storyteller, the entertainy tainer. And sorry, I did not listen. I mean, Alistair Begg's a smart guy. I'm sure that he has some insight into this kind of thing. So I don't super, I'm not super familiar with Alistair Begg. I don't really have anything to say one way or another about him. Alex I, Trebek. Uh, Alex Trebek is great. Dead now, but a good fellow at reading things. I feel uncomfortable with this because I feel like a lot of these categories might be used by a certain sort of person to beat up on the preaching that is done at one church of the King or any number of other faithful churches or begs own sermon right here. Right. Begs the Chris says he was laughing. It sounds like beg was actually being something of an, an entertainer. entertainer. 
And he was probably telling some stories. And we come from sitting under the preaching of Tim Bailey, and he's a wonderful, com- wonderfully compelling man who uh, tells a lot of stories. Surely, I guess you could say, cheerleads, conjures, certainly storytells, and can be very entertaining. Uh, I wouldn't say that's ever his goal exactly. Like his goal is to bring the word of God, but he's also an, a very effective communicator, as is Doug Wilson, as are lots of people that we like that are out there that are using all of the, the tricks tools of rhetoric, the tool shed. You know, all of the tools in the toolbox, all of the throwing the kitchen sink at, at men's consciences. You know, you, you could accuse Nathan the prophet of being a storyteller. Right. So, again, we did. Or David of being an entertainer when he wrote songs. Right. To put his prayers into. So I didn't actually listen to this. It's possible that the way Beg's talking about it is something that we would agree with. Certainly, there are many wicked men who use the tools of rhetoric in in very shallow, wicked ways. I to mean, avoid the truth of God's word. To avoid the, yeah. Right. And, and certainly those men should be avoided and despised and all of that. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bat- bathwater. We do not believe that. And there is a kind of church. I think we've probably all run to a church where it's like, oh, somewhere along the line, this pastor decided that to use any kind of tool of rhetoric was to be faithless. And, yeah. and therefore he's boring. And and that is its own sin when you're talking about the holy things of God and you're boring. You're not effectively communicating the holy things of God. I don't see the Apostle Paul being boring. I see the Apostle Paul being like, I always say about him, like, it feels like he's willing to shout and mock and jump and stand on his head to get his point across. Mm-hmm. Like, just whatever it takes. Sometimes he reaches the heights of rhetorical elo- eloquence, and sometimes he's very blunt, and sometimes he's almost what we might think of as vulgar. Like. One thing he's not, though, is like, well, I don't want to detract from the words of Christ, and I don't want anyone to think I'm a cheerleader or a conjurer or a storyteller or entertainer, so I'm not going to use any of the tools as the smartest man of my age that I've been given. Like, So I think there's, again, without having actually listened to Beg, I think there's a very reductive way to to use this frame. But Nathan, what about the part of uh, the Bible where Paul's like, I didn't come to you in cleverness of speech or with lofty words of wisdom. I resolved to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's pretty good. That's pretty, pretty close. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. From wherever that was. Second, uh, first, first Corinthians oh, first, uh, first, 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 first. 1. That's what I thought was. Yeah. Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, okay, that's a great that's a great counterpoint. So what do we say to that? Oh, we just say, I mean, we just say that uh, any, any device of rhetoric should be used to make the point of God's word sharper and not to dull it. And that anyone who uses a story well, like Jesus using a parable or who mocks something like Jesus mocking the Pharisees or who is blunt or, or pulls the rug out from under someone like Nathan the prophet is doing it to make the word of God sharper mm-hmm. to that person and not to blunt its edge. Not to obscure it, not, not to, to hide it, not to soften right. it. Not, not yeah, because, because in, anyone who uses these devices well doesn't increase. Their aim is not to, is not to make people think they're so clever and good at rhetoric and stuff. And that's I mean, what if, you want, if you want to get rid of storytelling, you have to cut out a lot of Jesus' teaching and preaching. Mm-hmm. If you want to get rid of rhetorical excellence, you got to get rid of the wisdom literature, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes. The Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the uh. Mount. Well, so I remembered, actually, I have in my notes a passage from Calvin because I, I wanted to see, I, I, I did feel oppressed by that interpretation of this passage at a certain point in my life. So I looked up what John Calvin, the great theologian, says, and he says this, But what if anyone should at the present day, by discoursing with some degree of eloquence, adorn the doctrine of the gospel by eloquence? Would he deserve to be on that account rejected as though he either polluted it or obscured Christ's glory? I answer in the first place that eloquence is not at all at variance with the simplicity of the gospel, when it does not merely not disdain to give way to it and be in subjection to it, but also yields service to it as a handmaid to her mistress. For as Augustine says, who who gave Peter a fisherman gave also... Cyprian, an orator. By this he means that both are from God, notwithstanding that the one who is much the superior of the other as to dignity is utterly devoid of gracefulness of speech, while the other who sits at his feet is distinguished by the fame of his eloquence. 
that eloquence, therefore, is neither to be condemned nor despised, which has no tendency to lead Christians to be taken up with an outward glitter of words or intoxicate them with empty delight or tickle their ears with this tinkling sound or he goes on. But the the basic point is, of course, God wants us to use every tool in the toolkit to adorn the gospel and to present the gospel. Of course, when it becomes self-serving, when it becomes a means, when it becomes an end rather than a means. And this is what Paul's actually addressing as super apostles who are meant uh, uh, using their rhetoric to draw men after themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. But make- but make no mistake, Paul's one of the great rhetoricians that ever lived. I mean, we've been going through, Jake's been preaching through Romans on Sunday mornings at Church of the King. And it's like, there's some real enviable uh, writing skill that went into that book. It's yep. very easy to be impressed by the writing and the structure <laughs> mm-hmm. of the thoughts and the eloquence with which they're yep. expressed. And it's like, Paul didn't feel like, oh no, I better make this crap. I better like not be too eloquent or I'll be subtracting from what Christ wants to do and from his glory. And unfortunately, I think that's what some binary thinker types have done with this strain of thought. So yeah, anything else to say about that? Nope. Yeah. All right. Again, might be a wonderful Alistair Begg thing. I, we, none of us actually listened to it. Sorry. Uh, negative world arrives in Australia. What's this all about? This is an article by Mirror Orthodoxy. Yeah, this is, this is about Andrew Thorburn, who was, who was selected to, to be, oh, I'm sorry, the president. I forget. He was, he was going to be, he was going to have a, quote, high-profile role at one of Australia's most prestigious professional sporting clubs, unquote, and he was ejected because of a sermon that was given 10 years ago at the church he currently attends. I mean, he was kind of forced to resign. So, and then in the wake of that, there was an interview on an Australian talk show or news show with the pastor of that church, who's a young, hip guy. So this, this article is about how, oh, hey, this, this, this vindicates, if, anyone, if any of our listeners have heard of Aaron Wren, of course you have, and his negative world thing, which you probably have, Especially if you're Once on our you describe Discord. It anyway. Yeah, negative world is the world that Aaron Wren says we're in now as Christians when Christianity is, it's, 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 it's frowned upon. The positive world was, and I don't remember the, the, the way he splits up the timelines, but it's like probably been 20 years or so since positive world when Christian values were good, right. basically. Like, uh, and the neutral world was a little more neutral and non-negative is... Uh, People don't like it. Nobody's and giving Christianity the benefit of a doubt. Everybody. No one is, and you better explain yourself and stuff. And so this is this article is saying, hey, all this stuff that that Aaron Wren said and like the kind of things James Wood, who I haven't read, writes for First Things apparently, criticizes Tim Keller for and his style of cultural engagement, his winsome approach. Mm. That's that the negative world is true, and the winsome approach it doesn't work. And that I think. I think that if you if you watch this little interview clip that's linked in the Mirror Orthodoxy article, you get a really cringy, a really cringy interview with a with a, with a pastor who just will not answer questions at all. He comes across like what he is, which is a much less sophisticated devotee of Tim Keller mm-hmm. and the guys, because the interviewer is like, "Hey, you know, you Christians, you're so bigoted. You say." Abortion's like a Holocaust, and you call homosexuality as a sin, and the guy will not. He'll just say, well, Christians are all about life and love. Jesus is about life and love. And it doesn't matter what the interviewer says or asks, he just won't give a truthful answer. Right. And so, it's it's cringy. It's cringy. This article, though, is very cringy as well, I have to say. This this article is, <laughs> is like... It's noting how that pastor came across so bad. And then and then he asks, this is a Gospel Coalition thing to do right here. He's like, is Mason at fault here? It may depend on what he was aiming to do. If Mason was primarily intending to talk to his people, his congregations, and those they are trying to reach in the inner suburbs of Melbourne, then he could be excused. Perhaps he was not aiming to win public points for the faith, but rather wanted to pre- present a pastoral face for City on a Hill, which is the name of this hip church in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Which is just a very pathetic, <laughs> just a very pathetic take from Simon Kennedy at Mere Orthodoxy. I have no idea who that is. I don't either, but just, I, know, I think I know a couple of good guys that write for Mere Orthodoxy, but not him. Just, just say that he's lying. I mean, he's not willing to to talk about what to say what the Bible says, and he's obviously ashamed of 
saying it and I can't. well I disagree with the large I mean I agree with the larger point which is that winsomeness is dead if it ever had a place yeah I don't know any other deep thoughts about this one guys like no Chris is this is another one I didn't watch but Chris's observation is what's going on here is not a Christian being persecuted but a worldling being purified to the religion of the world and that's a yeah I would agree with that yeah seems to be true yeah. It seems to be a pretty great way of putting it. I mean, I've talked about this before on the podcast and you can like find, it. you can find places where I tell the say the whole story, but I famously wrote that open letter to Ray where I tried to use every sort of pop culture reference to appeal to people who liked pop culture. And I don't know that the article was sinful, but people hated it and hated me. And the fact that I threw in a lot of pop culture references and showed how much pop culture I, I knew really didn't matter to people whose consciences were, in this case, being pricked. And that taught me a valuable lesson about trying to be trying to meet the world halfway. You can't meet the world halfway. Jesus is a pariah to them. Like, mm-hmm. it's worship Christ or worship the gods of the world. And Jesus is a threat to every god of the world. And they feel it. So my, so if you're being honest, on any level, no matter how dre- much you dress it up, people's hearts and their consciences will be pricked, and they won't be happy that you dressed it up. You'll just have wasted everyone's time. So that's not that, you know, we just got done saying, it's okay to use rhetoric. It's not that you don't be nice. It's not that you don't be kind. It's not that you don't find ways of meeting people where they're at in different ways, but, but never think that if I just do a little bit of what the world does. If I just cover up some of the truth of Scripture or blunt the point of blunt who Jesus was, then that will win influence. Right. It, it doesn't work. Nobody actually respects I mean, that. It, this, it, yeah, the interview is just the newscaster saying over and over again in so many words, aren't you kind of lying to me about what you actually think? And the pastor saying, I'm not going to tell you what <laughs> the Bible says. And pastors have been doing that sort of thing since, what, Osteen on Larry King. Oh, or- man. Keller on Larry King, I think, too. Yeah, I mean, mm. yeah, and Larry King would kind of play along. He'd be like, well, here's my interesting question. And they'd be like, blah, blah, blah. And he might put <laughs> Rick, back a Rick, little bit. Rick Warren on Rick Warren, that's, that's, that's what it was. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, was God in control of the winds in the hurricane? Yes. But the wind, Rick, how about the wind? Right. Did God have stopped the wind? Was he in control? Was he? And just the deflection on deflection yeah. on deflection. And I was like, dude, either either lie and say no, or say yes, or, or say yes, but like, there's any number of answers you could give, but the, I just refuse to answer this question. Well, I think Jesus wants us to love the people that are hurt. Yes, but the wind, Rick, what about the wind? Yeah, I forgot about that. That was crazy. Man, that's so bad. I think it was, who was it when 9-11 happened? Uh, that might have been, well, Keller preached that sermon around the time of 9-11 mm-hmm. that was had that style it was terrible all right well the point of this whole thing is that now we're living in a world where larry king was kind of still cordial and accepting of rick warren but this you know in australia they're just like why are you deflecting and lying to us this is dumb yeah yep so okay that's november in the church in 1984 any final thoughts gentlemen nope november in the church in 1984 church of the king's been pretty good yeah, that's true. Yeah, added. <sighs> what? How many new members? 17. Uh, 12. 12. So a dozen new members? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it, Where did that, that 17 come from? I think I got it from you at one point. You probably did. But, and, and there, there are kids I'm not including in that because I'm, that's only communicant members. But if we count all the kids, so it's 12 I think it's communicant. More than 12 communicant. And so then it's going to be more than that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It was yeah. really, really awesome. Yeah. It's great. Good people. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. I've been going through Romans, which is awesome. Ben just preached a sermon on in our American God series on Mormonism. Mormonism. You can listen to if you want some handles about Mormonism. Yeah. Uh, it's bad. Turns yeah. out it's bad. It's bad. That was one of the big conclusions Don't I reached. Don't be a Mormon. Don't be a Mormon. Dum da dum dum dum. Shocking conclusion. That was a South Park reference. Uh, I got the South Park. I didn't. Right. They did an episode where they went through the entire history of Mormonism. And what they all believe in in the dum da dum dum dum. There was a there was a musical a chorus. Dumb, 
you know, it's right. a, yeah. a, a, a I get it. pull off, you know. Joseph very... Smith looked in a hat. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like that. It was one of their... It's uh, pretty amazing. One of the better things they ever did. Those guys did the Book of Mormon, the musical. Yes. The big hit. Which is incredibly blasphemous, but also those guys do understand Mormons. <laughs> right. They have a and lot of sympathy. Hate for, them. They hate them. They hate them and they kind of love them. Uh, you just get the sense they grew up with Mormons, which I think they did. I think those guys are from Utah or Colorado, maybe. But in any case, I do not currently watch South Park. I do not recommend that anyone watch South Park. I am a teenager of the Audis, so sue me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there are things I know that I wish I didn't, like some South Park references and American Pie and all kinds of stuff like that. Team America, World Police. Amer- yeah, it's like yeah, which Ben references. All at least once time. a week. He really does. Yeah. I've never seen it. I've but you never do seen it. it. You do reference it. I know. I know. It's, it's, it was a, there was a really funny thing in a computer mm. game that to me was independently funny. Where they just sourced a, a sound effect or something. <laughs> but <laughs> Ben will constantly be murmuring <laughs> in a corner, burka, 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 Muhammad Allah Jihad. <laughs> no, I, I just say burka, burka, burka. That's all that I say. So, yeah, it's just a, it's just a freeware computer uh, no, I, game. I always hear Muhammad Allah that's, Jihad that's right. afterwards. That's what... That's what <laughs> That's what you add, Jake, in your own mind. Anyway, yes. We were alive during the Audis. Yeah, I have decided if I write a novel that tries to capture our lives or, or something, I will set it in 1999. I think that is the time. Hmm. I think that's the year that people our age should be looking back on, thinking about documenting. We, we, we all partied like it was 1999. <laughs> well, exactly. And it's right before the world went to hell. And it, with 2001 uh, Space Odyssey. With, uh, September 11th. Yeah, September 11th. You know, it's it's just like... It's the nexus point of our of our generation, I think, 1999. Plus, The Matrix came out. And American Plus, Pie. we're all worried about Y2K. Y2K, yeah. I mean, it's just like, it was a magical time. So many things going on. Backstreet Boys Millennium. Yeah. Yep. The dial-up internet. AOL, AOL. AOL. It's messenger, baby. You've got mail. If I, if, if, if I ever finally sit down and write The Ville, the novel, I think, I'll, I think I'll set it in 1999. I think it's a good time for all those characters. But anyway, there you go. You heard it here first folks so anyway patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity that's the place to go be part of our discord drop articles in make us talk about them we're happy to do it what sound effect did i just put on i don't know i don't hear anything but it looks like it's going oh i hear it i hear it Until next time, stay sane.